Five years ago, we set out on a journey. Today, our journey continues to help students develop critical financial skills and includes equipping students with tech skills for the jobs of today and tomorrow. This is our opportunity to close the education, skills, and opportunity gap in our communities by empowering educators and inspiring students to help today's youth become tomorrow's tech-driven workforce and business leaders to access their potential. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. First of all, let me, I, I need you guys to do me a favor. If you're on Twitter, follow me at Dr. Shepherd 2013. And I need you to tweet all the cool pictures you're tweeting out there and talk about how cool it is to hear about science from all of us scientists today and engineers. So at Dr. Shepherd 2013. So I have this talk that may be confusing you. Uh, zombies, sports, and cola, or cola and sports. What does that have to do with weather and climate? I'm gonna talk about that today. Well, I, I promise I'll try to make a little bit of sense out of it today because I'm a meteorologist. I spent, I actually spent a little of my time career here in the Washington DC area. How many of you are familiar with Goddard Space Flight Center by show of hands? I worked for 12 years at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center developing weather and climate satellites to study things like that hurricane there that's moving on to land. You can see the night lights there of all the major cities there. So those are the types of things that I've spent my career doing. Now here's the 2017 hurricane season. Uh, this is actually from some of my colleagues at NASA Goddard. And if you look carefully, you'll see things like Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma. You can see the dust coming off of the African continent. You can see wildfire smoke up in the Northwest US and Southwest Canada, as well as in the Iberian Peninsula around Spain and Portugal. This is really interesting because as meteorologists and as climate scientists, we have an array of observational capabilities and models that allow us to predict weather and climate. And do, we do it pretty well. Uh, as, a, as a meteorologist, people often say, well, what channel are you on? Or what's the weather gonna be tomorrow? Or my aunt's getting married next uh, year, is it gonna rain outside, it's an outdoor wedding? I don't know the answer to any of those questions. I'm a research meteorologist. Uh, only about 8% of meteorologists are on TV telling you the weather and pointing at boards and those types of things. Most, I'm the former president of the American Meteorological Society, and by our own data, only about 8% of the meteorologists are on TV, but that's what the public thinks we know. So this really gives you an indication of just how our technology has evolved. So what I really, uh, first of all, uh, here's my introductory slide, and I love this little thing here. It's only in America uh, will we hear weather predictions from a rodent, but yet deny climate science from scientists. I get that all of the time, and I like to lead with that, because I'll actually have people come up and say, well, hey, Dr. Shepard, what do you think of the groundhog forecast? And I'll say, I think it's a rodent. Um, <laughs> But then in the same breath, they'll say, um, but you know, I think that climate change stuff is a hoax. So that's an interesting example for some of you, a word that you'll hear later on uh, called cognitive dissonance, where uh, hopefully you can remember that very fancy term. Uh, so my goals today are to quickly, I don't have a lot of time to highlight some of the challenges of communicating my science, weather and climate, meteorology and climate. And I'll even challenge some of your own biases and perce uh, perceptions on some of this. Now, you're, you're students, so you tend to get this. Uh, uh, I, I don't tend to have as much of a challenge with students in your age group. I have a 14-year-old daughter, uh, an eighth grader, so uh, I'm very aware of sort of how uh, your peers and, and whatnot think about some of these things. Uh, I do work in a field, meteorology and sometimes climate, where people will often believe they're sort of very aware of and understand the science because everybody experiences the weather, right? I could go across the street here to the subway shop and get a sandwich and I tell somebody I'm a meteorologist or a climate scientist and they'll immediately start like offering their thoughts or opinions on the weather or climate change. I've got a friend that's a nuclear engineer. He never gets that at Subway or in the mall. No one ever offers advice on fuel rods for nuclear reactors to him. But weather is one of those fields where people just feel like they know it. You know, they're familiar with the groundhog and the farmer's almanac and all of those types of things. Oh, my knee's hurting, there may be some storms tomorrow. Uh, so there are all kinds of things out there. By the way, that, our, our joints are sensitive to changes in air, atmospheric pressure, and that can be an indicator of changes in weather. Uh, looks like a little change in weather happening here in DC, 
perhaps this Sunday, I looked at the weather models before I came over this morning. Still a little uncertainty on this snow forecast for Saturday here in DC. It looks like something's gonna fall from the sky uh, in terms of the amount, who, it really depend on the, the track of the particular storm, as it always does in DC uh, area, having lived here myself. Um, I wanna talk about one particular challenge I see in meteorology and climate, and that's perceptions and psychology. Anyone know what this is? Well, you may not, but I'll tell you. That's Houston, Texas, after Hurricane Harvey. Now, a week before Hurricane Harvey made landfall, meteorologists like me were saying you might get 40 to 50 inches of rain from that storm. In fact, I write for Forbes magazine, a science column on weather and climate, and I wrote an article a week in advance saying you might get 40 to 50 inches of rain. Yet after that storm, there were people on media and there were mayors and policymakers saying, we didn't think it was gonna be that bad. But the, we, I'm sitting there saying, we told you it was gonna be that bad. But the perception is, because Houston gets rain and floods all the time, they say, nah, we get that all the time. But the, the, the lesson in that is that this was an, what's called an anomaly event, an extreme event. And so in our own lives, our own understandings of things that we've experienced cannot prepare us for something outside the realm of what we haven't experienced. And that's what I saw with this particular event. Even in Atlanta, Georgia, where I live, a few years ago, there was a big snowstorm, big, two inches, all two inches of it, uh, that really shut down the city of Atlanta. It caused a lot of problems. Not so much because we can't handle two inches of snow, but it was when that snow fell and the fact that people's perception was a winter storm watch was changed to a winter weather advisory. And we don't get a lot of snow in the South, so everybody thought that meant it was a downgrade. It means, oh, it's getting better. We're not, we don't have anything to worry about, but that actually meant it was gonna be worse. And so uh, there was a perception of what watch advisory and warning means. So I see in the field of weather all the time. And the one I hear these days is polar vortex. Every time it gets cold, oh, it's the polar vortex. Polar vortex is coming. It's an Arctic hurricane. It's an Arctic tornado. I hear all of that. It's none of that. <laughs> Every time it gets cold, it is not the polar vortex. The polar vortex is always there, always has been there. But there was this real sort of big media push a couple of years ago um, because there was this really strange thing happening where the polar vortex weakened uh, and it allowed really cold air to spill into the U.S. around 2015 or so. Uh, that can happen. It does happen. But the polar vortex is nothing new, nor is the term bomb cyclone or bombogenesis. All, all these buzzwords we hear in the media, bomb cyclone is just a nor'easter or, or a storm that intensifies really rapidly. We've known about it in the peer-reviewed and scientific literature in my field for decades. So just be careful about these little buzzy words that you hear uh, and when you're consuming weather and climate information. Challenge number two, science is not a belief system. Why do I say that? I get this question a lot. Hey, Dr. Shepard, do you believe in climate change? Do you believe in global warming? Um, I say my son believes in a tooth fairy. And it's costing me a lot of dollars. Um, but really the question that I want to put forth here is this. When I hear that question, I, think, I just think it's an ill-posed question. I mean, what if I asked you, think, think how this would sound. What if I ask you, what's your name? Liam? Liam? What if I asked Liam, hey Liam, see that skyscraper there in Atlanta, Georgia with the tall gold peak? Do you believe in gravity? If I throw a ball off that building, is it going to fall? Of course it is. How silly does that sound to say, do you believe in gravity? So when someone asks me, do you believe in climate change, that's what it sounds like to me. It's an ill-posed question. There are colleagues of mine at Yale University have done a study that have found that the American public breaks out into six groups on what they think about climate change. It's really interesting. So you've got this group that's alarmed, uh, and then all the way at the end there, you have this what we call dismissive. And that dismissive is actually a pretty small number of people, but they're the loudest. They're the ones that tweet me with all these crazy theories and you're saying it's a hoax and all those types of things. So it's important to try to understand where you are on this Six America study, where your parents are, your aunt and uncle. I don't spend a lot of time with the dismissive because you're just going to end up banging your head on the wall because uh, you're not going to change anything there. Uh, but it's important to understand who you're dealing with in terms of talking about these issues. Challenge three, 
couple of really fancy big words, but I'll teach them to you, and I guarantee you, you already have experienced them, even if you've never seen the words before. Confirmation bias and the Dunning-Kruger effect. By show of hands, who's heard of confirmation bias? Okay, so a lot of you have. What about Dunning-Kruger effect? Got to be less hands. All right. Even though you haven't heard the term Dunning-Kruger effect, you know it when you see it. Watch. So Dunning-Kruger effect. This fancy word, these two professors at Cornell, uh, it's defined as a cognitive bias in which unskilled individuals suffer from illusory superiority, mistakenly rating their ability much higher than is accurate. Now that's fancy wording. Here's the Dr. Shepard version. People think they know more than they do. That's, that's what they think they know more than they do, or they underestimate what they don't know. And I see, <clears throat> excuse me, get some water here. I see this all of the time in science. For example, believe it or not, even though I have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD in physical meteorology, I will have people come up to me all of the time and say, well, you know, Dr. Shepard, the climate changes naturally. And I said, I better know that or Florida State better take all of those degrees back because I promise I didn't miss that. And you can see that here. There's a look at the last six to 800,000 years, uh, the interglacial and glacial periods, those Gs, those are essentially the ice ages. And because of something called the Milankovitch cycles, the changes in the Earth's orbit change on its axis, we get these variations in climate. So of course our climate changes naturally. But Home run hitters can hit home runs naturally, but if they use steroids, they hit longer ones and more of them, right? So any natural cycle can change, but yet as a part of that Dunning-Kruger effect, people often seem to know, feel like they're telling me something when they say the climate changes naturally. I promise you most climate scientists know that. Grass grows naturally, doesn't it? But if we put fertilizer on the soil, isn't it growing differently? So there's nothing to suggest that natural processes can't be changed by humans. It's not either or, it's and. Then there's confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is when we consume information that already supports what we already believe. Now, good scientists aren't going to do that. Right? As a scientist, we're going to consume information objectively. We're going to look at all of the data, all of the peer review. It's important to look at credible information, though. Right? There are a lot of opinions out there on Twitter and in gray literature. Uh, as scientists, I use uh, my time looking at what's called the peer-reviewed literature. And it's important to understand that all information is not necessarily created equal just because it's out there on the internet, right? My son is 10 years old. He's pretty adept at creating websites. He could write something tomorrow and put it on his website saying he's cured uh, headaches, right? He said, I mixed some ammonia, some Febreze, and some soap, and it's gonna cure your headache. All right? He can put that on the internet tomorrow, right? <laughs> Doesn't mean it's right or accurate. It hasn't been FDA evaluated. And that's what you see a lot of with weather and climate information, too. Even you'll see some, some person out there putting out some fake weather model information saying, hey, four weeks from now, we're going to get a snowstorm here in D.C. The problem is weather models aren't good four weeks out. So it's important to understand stuff like that before you hit share or tweet, retweet, right? I can't tell you, I got friends, I can't tell you how often I see some friend of mine on Facebook, like, you know, your, our, your parents' age, they're forwarding something. Oh, look, Dr. Sherr, we're going to have a storm here, a snowstorm here in Atlanta in five weeks. And I said, no, we're not. So be careful about what kind of information you share. Challenge four, too many graphs, too much jargon. Scientists are really bad at this kind of thing. Here's a look, that top left picture is the road that connects Savannah, Georgia to Tybee Island down where I live, not where I live, but in my state. That, that's a flood, and it's a king tide, tide flood, just a regular high tide type flood. It didn't, there wasn't no storm, but the road flooded. So this is the kind of, I would show that to the Rotary Club in Savannah if I was giving a talk to them. That, that bottom left is satellite data from NASA showing sea level rise. I'd show that if I was going to a science conference. So it's important that we communicate messages appropriate, appropriately, not just show the same thing uh, to different audiences all of the time. You see this list here? Here's a list of words that scientists often throw around very cavalierly. We throw around words like bias and uncertainty and positive trend. What does the word positive sound like to most people in the public? That's good, right? But when I say a positive trend in CO2 or carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, is that good? 
Exactly. So we have to be careful and think careful about our words. We, we hear the word bias. That sounds really evil or dis, distorted. But in science, a bias just means that thermometer may have a two degree warm bias. It means it's always warm by two degrees. So how we talk about science is very important. Challenge five, literacy of climate. Um, whenever, like tomorrow, it's going to snow. I mean, Saturday, it's going to snow probably somewhere in this area, maybe slightly north or maybe here in D.C. And I'm going to have some dude tweet me and say, hey, Dr. Shepard, I got 20 inches or I got five inches of global warming in my yard. What are you guys talking about? All right. But that, that tweet shows me that that person doesn't understand the difference between weather and climate. Right. It's one of the most sort of amusing yet inaccurate tweets in history because weather is your mood and climate is your personality. Think about what I'm saying there. Weather is your mood. Climate is your personality. So today's weather or even Saturday's weather doesn't tell us anything about climate. No more than your mood tells me about your personality today. You dress for today's weather, the clothing that you have on, right? But what you have on today doesn't tell me anything about what's in your closet, right? In your closet, you've got clothes for all types of climate and weather, right? So we have to be, uh, understand that today or even a week's weather doesn't say anything about climate. And then the last challenge that I see as it relates to both weather and climate, I call them climate zombie theories, right? Zombie theories. Zombies, anybody watch The Walking Dead by chance? Oh goodness, yes. I don't get it. I just don't get that show. <laughs> I know it's popular though. It's filmed right there in Georgia, in Atlanta. Uh, even some parts of it are filmed on the University of Georgia's campus where I am. So zombies, they, they're, they, they're supposed to be like the walking dead, right? I mean, they're, they walk, they're dead, but they kind of live on. There are these theories in weather and climate that are the same way. Science has long refuted them, but they just live on on blogs and TV stations and op-eds in the newspaper. Um, I call them zombie theory. So uh, there are certain ones like, oh, it's always, climate's always changed, or oh, it's the sun, or it hasn't warmed since 1998. I, I, there are hundreds of them. If you want to see them all, go to skepticalscience.com. It's a really good website to refute some of this. There are even zombie theories in weather. By show of hands, how many of you have been told by your grandma or your aunt that heat lightning exists? How many of you have heard of heat lightning? That might just be a southern thing. No, okay when the sky lights up with lightning, but you can't really hear the thunder or anything? Well, it's not caused by the heat of the day or anything like that. It's just too far away to hear the thunder, right? But a lot of people call that heat lightning. So that's a zombie theory. Uh, have, have any of you ever heard some people say, oh, it can't get cold in deserts? I've heard that a few people often. I, I come across that. That's a zombie theory. It gets really cold in deserts sometimes, especially at night. So uh, the polar vortex is a zombie theory, right? Every time it gets cold, it's not the polar vortex. So that's what I mean by zombie theories. So as I wrap up, I want to just kind of leave this advice to you for those of you. I was talking to a young lady here. What was your name again? Martha is, just told me that she's interested in being a meteorologist. Shout out to Martha. Um, one of the really interesting things about the weather and climate world that I'm in, and I'm the director of a major program at a major university, is to make sure if you want to go into weather, or meteorology, atmospheric sciences, climatology, like any science, it's a lot of math and physics. Believe it or not, um, when you take courses in meteorology in, in my program at University of Georgia or Florida State where I went, you may or may not ever see clouds in a classroom, <laughs> as weird as that sounds. Yeah, you're going to see it in an introductory class, but most of what you're going to see is a lot of fluid dynamics, thermodynamics, physics, because the atmosphere is a fluid. So most adults in this room, well, this is probably a very science attentive group of adults, so I won't say that. A lot of adults in the American public, I would venture to say well more than 70%, do not know how weather forecasts are made. And a lot of adults do not know what I mean when I say there's a 30% chance of rain. Do, who thinks they know what both of the answers are? Who thinks you really unequivocally know how weather forecasts are made? Who thinks unequivocally you know what it means when you hear the weather person say 30% chance of rain by show of hand? Look at that. Not a lot of people raise their hands, yet we give that information. Well, weather forecasts are made by solving very complex uh, fluid dynamics equations that change the atmospheric fluid over time. So those of you that will take calculus one day, there will be something you'll learn about called an initial value problem. So we take measurements of the atmosphere using weather balloons, satellites, uh, data on the ground, radar. We put that into these numerical computer models that solve the equations to predict how the atmosphere is going to look on Saturday. 
or on Sunday or next Monday or next Tuesday, except beyond about seven to 10 days, those equations break down. That's why forecasts aren't really good beyond that. So just to give you an analogy, I could put a beach ball in the Potomac, Potomac River out there by say, National Airport, and I could solve a set of equations to predict where that beach ball is three days from now. Because the river just is a fluid, just like the atmosphere, and so I can solve the equation of its governing motions. That's how weather forecasts are made. Now, the other thing, because people will say, oh, it must be nice to work as a meteorologist, you guys get paid to be wrong 50% of the time. So I hear that a lot, but when I hear that, it tells me that person doesn't understand math or statistics. Because we're actually right about 97% of the time, but here's the challenge. People only remember the one bad forecast or the two or three in a given time period. You don't remember the days that were right every day. Right? You tend to remember the days that were wrong. And those aren't very many, but they tend to stick in our minds. The other thing is that people don't know what percent chance of rain means. Um, I'm getting close on time, so I gotta wrap this up quickly. But when I say there's a 30% chance of rain or a 20% chance of rain, there are people that will think, oh, that means it's probably not gonna rain today. That's not what that means at all. That means that the area around Washington, D.C., 20, uh, 175 miles around or whatever it is, there's a, uh, the forecaster has certain, some level of confidence that a percentage of that area is going to get rain. So if the forecasters are 100% confident that 20% of the area is going to get rain, what's the forecast percent? 20%. If they're 50% confident that 20% of the area is going to get rain, what's the percent chance of rain? 10%, right? 0.5 times two, all right? So y'all see how that works? So I'm tubing in the North Georgia mountains on the, in an inner tube coming down the Chattahoochee River. My son starts raining and the lady next to me says, man, those meteorologists, they make me so mad. It was only a 20% chance of rain today and here it is raining. She didn't know what I did as a living. I'm right next to her. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, well, it wasn't a hundred percent, I mean, it wasn't a zero percent chance of rain. So why are you complaining? We're, we're in the 20% of the area that was supposed to get rain that day. But yeah, because people don't understand what that means, they'll say we're wrong. So it's important to understand sort of things like that before you make interpretations about forecasts. So those are just some little insights into my world as a meteorologist as a, and as a climate scientist. So thank you guys very much.